All right. Well, if you want to throw that slide up, I'm going to talk to you guys about influence. It is, this is the somewhat, I guess, official definition. The capacity to have an effect on the character, deployment, or behavior of someone or something or the effect itself. You know, I think uh, we don't ask ourselves often enough what influences us in our lives. You know, what's amazing is uh, if you just right now thought to yourself, what is influencing my life? Just maybe not this very second in here, but in life, what are the things that are structured in your life? I think often not intentional. I think there's times we're intentional about structuring things that influence us, but I think there's other times things just influence us because we're going to work, we're going here, we're going there, we're busy, and things just influence us. How many people would agree with that? So I think what happens is I think that we're often not strategic about what influences us. I think we just go through life. And I believe that compromise in most of our lives is something that holds us back from what God wants in our lives. I believe it over and over again. I think it creeps in, um, and I think it doesn't just creep in at times. At times, I think it actually kicks the door in and pushes us down and tries really hard to get us to have compromise at every level. And so I believe that influence is something that all of us have. But I think as Christians, most of us realize we, we need more influence that's positive. But more than that, we need to be influencers that are pushing positive on others. And, and I think so often in life, like I said, what influences us? What's influencing in your life? What, what's the, what are the things that are in front of you that's influencing? More than that, the people around you, the, the relationships you put on, all those things. Those, whether we believe it or not, have massive influence in our lives. I want to look at a couple scriptures. You know, so often um, I read through the Word, and and I just these there's these amazing passages, and and these are just a couple scriptures. This one I didn't want to read a lot of, but it's such a good story that I might read more than I than I wanted to. So, um, but you know, I as a Christian want to have the influences in my life making me. I guess the word I'll use is greater, better, more Christ-like, right? That's what I want in my life. But the fruit of that is supposed to be me being a man of greater influence. And I think when we think of greater influence, we start, I think, I think our mind gets twisted with what the world calls influence. When I think greater influence in my life, I want to be a man who pushes the kingdom forward in a positive way, meaning how I respond, how I act, how, I, how do I interact with people, what I say. My influence as a man, I want it to grow, not just shrink, correct? Not just be the same person I am. I want it to grow. And so I think so often fear of man and other things causes our influence to shrink. I think if... If we had an idea of how much influence we actually have currently, that it would impact everyone around us. I believe that. I think so often we don't, we don't have a clue how much influence we currently have. And more than that, I think fear of man and other people and uncertainty and all those things is what causes our influence to shrink back. Because we think, oh, I would say that, but I can't. It's not my place. There's all these reasons that the influence that God's put in us all of a sudden, it shrinks back. And there's so many scriptures that are just these amazing men of God that in their journey, somebody with greater influence, they thought, either thwarted God's will in their life because they listened to them instead of God, or let's just jump in the scripture. That'd be better. So I don't have this up there, so I'm not actually going there yet. So if you want to, you can, you can all stare at it for a few minutes. But uh, 1 Kings 13. So if you got your Bible or you got an app or something, we're going to 1 Kings 13. Again, I, I, I'm not going to say anything else. So I'm going to jump in here. This is a prophet that denounces Jeroboam. The amazing thing about this story to me is it's, it has so much prophetic in it, but then so much things that I think for us we can tangibly grasp. So I'm going to jump into 13 here. It says, at the Lord's command, a man of God, say man of God. That's a pretty cool name, I'm not going to lie. From Judea, went back to Bethel. Arriving there, just as Jeroboam was approaching the altar to burn incense, then the Lord's command, he shouted, O altar, altar. 
Now, he starts prophesying over this altar, saying, you are going to break in half. Ashes are going to pour out of you. And as he's prophesying over this and gets ready to leave, Jeroboam stops him and says, arrest that man. And I'm going to jump in right here. It says, he pointed at him and shouted, seize that man. But instantly the king's hand became paralyzed in that position, and he couldn't pull it back. At the same time, a wide crack appeared in the altar and ashes poured out, just as the man of God he had predicted in his message from the Lord. The king cried out to the man, please ask your Lord, your God, to restore my hand again. So the man of God prayed to the Lord, and the king's hand was restored, and he could move it again. Then the king said to the man of God, come to the place with me, come to the palace with me, and have something to eat, and I will give you a gift. But the man of God said to the king, even if you give me half of everything you own, I would not go with you. I would not eat or drink anything in this palace. For the Lord gave me this command. You must not eat or drink anything while you're there. And do not return to Judea by the same way you came. So, by the same way you came. So he left Bethel and went home another way. Now, amazing thing here is uh, these, these young men were there whose father was an old prophet. So they went home and told dad about it. And when they get home, dad's pretty pumped about this. So he jumps on his donkey and rides out and finds the young prophet. And he asks the young prophet, actually, this is where I want to jump in. He, he meets the young prophet and he says right here, it says, this is what the Lord says. No, I've jumped way too far ahead. Wow. At least I, I learned a lesson. I number my pages. Years ago, I dropped all of them all over the ground, and I was like, well, I have no idea where I'm going tonight. <laughs> so it says, this is in 15, then he said to the man of God, come home with me and eat some food. This is the old man going, he meets the young, the young prophet, he's trying to get him to come home. He says, no, I cannot, he replied, I'm not allowed to eat or drink anything here in, the, in this place. For the Lord gave me this command. You must not eat or drink anything while you're there. Do not return to Jew. Now, the, the, the old prophet lies to him and says, uh, I'm a prophet too, and just as you are, and an angel gave me this command for the Lord. Bring home with you so you can have something to eat and drink. But the old man was lying to him. This is unbelievable. So the old man lies to him, so guess what he does? Goes home with him. <laughs> the old prophet influences the young man to go a, just to thwart God's will and goes home. So he goes home with him, he eats, and in the middle of them eating, uh, this old lying prophet gets a word from the Lord and says, you, you've disobeyed God and you are not going to make it home, you're going to die. How many people think it's a little bit intense? Right? So if you jump forward, he ends up going home and he ends up getting killed by a lion. Yeah, straight up, a lion just takes him out. The crazy thing to me about this is I think so often in our lives, God gives us, this, this is, to me, this is one of those intense things because a man of God that he actually, he trusted, lied to him. It's a whole different ballgame. I think so often there's times in our lives where the influence that people have around us are as great as we allow it to be. I think so often God gives us things in our hearts that we know we're, we're supposed to do. And the voice of the enemy or the voice of people around us disqualify that word. Now, I, I believe that if we're hearing the voice of God and we do the best we can, I think that there's many scriptures that show that men and women, people cannot thwart God's will in our life. They cannot if we're willing to obey God. It's impossible. But I think so often if we read scripture, we see that men and women influence us dramatically and at the same time, we have the potential to thwart God's plan in others' lives. Do you know how many times in my life I know that the Lord's told me to do something and I've heard over and over again what a bad idea it was? From people that love me, people that are all kinds of stuff told me, That's a, that sounds like a bad idea. I don't think you should do that. That sounds dangerous. That's been my whole life, actually. <laughs> that sounds dangerous. <laughs> uh, some of that was true, but... Early on, that's all I heard. That was too dangerous. You shouldn't do that. Stop doing that. It's you, you got wife and kids, right? That was early on because I just like to do extreme things. Then that moved into my Christian walk. And people often, over and over again, if I would have listened to all the voices, I thought, yeah, maybe this is a bad idea. 
There's no way, I, there's no way as a church I would have smuggled hundreds of thousands of dollars across the borders. I wouldn't have done it. I wouldn't have risked my life. I wouldn't have risked my family. I wouldn't have risked my, I wouldn't have risked it. There's no way. But I was willing to risk it because I knew we were in God's will. And I knew what we we're doing is kingdom business. But if we listen to the voices of, of everyone else, and it, what's worse than that, if we're that voice, guys, think about if we're that one influencing people saying, don't do that, that's bad, that sounds too extreme. I think that as Christian brothers and sisters, we, we need to watch our influence, both sides, what's coming in and what's going out. I'm going to jump into 1 Samuel here. No, Exodus. Let's do Exodus. You had it up. That's perfect. Exodus 32, 21. It says, he said to Aaron, this is Moses. Moses goes up um, to scribe um, the Ten Commandments, and he comes back and sees him worshiping an idol. He talks to Aaron. He says, he said to Aaron, what did these people do to you that you led them into such great sin? And Aaron says, do not be angry, my Lord. Aaron said, you know how prone these people are to evil. They said to me, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who brought us out of Egypt, we don't know what happened to him. So I told them, whoever has any gold jewelry, take it off. Then they gave me the gold and I threw it in the fire and out came this calf. <laughs> Boom. Oh, sweet. Let's worship. He was fearful of the people. He was in charge. He knew what needed to happen, but the people began to murmur, and he, he just didn't have what it took. He said, you know what? And he ends up, thousands of people died because on his watch, he wasn't willing to stand firm. 1 Samuel 15. This is Saul, and uh, God asked Saul to go into this area and kill everything because it was defiled. All the animals, everything. And what he does is he goes, and he doesn't kill everything. He brings some stuff back for burnt offerings. We jump in here. It says, Then Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned. I violated the Lord's command and your instructions. I was afraid of the men, so I gave in to them. Now I beg you, forgive my sins and come back with me so that I may worship the Lord. But Samuel said to him, I will not go back with you. You've rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected you as king over Israel. He allowed the, the people around him to influence him to the point of losing his role as king. We can go through scripture after, after scripture. You can go to the next slide, influence. After scripture after scripture of men and women who allowed either a, a lot of people or a few people around them to thwart the will of God in their life because they listened to that instead of listening to the will of God. And guys, I know it can be a dangerous place, and I know that there is, there is good counsel in our lives. There's times where we need counsel, right? We need lots of counsel. We need to ask questions. But we don't need counsel from everybody. We know with counseling people, a lot of times they go to people that they know what the answer is going to be. Or they pick the best one. <laughs> like, that one sounds tough. That one's a little rough. Perfect. I'll do that one. That one looks easy. Instead of just coming to a place of heart and saying, okay, God, what, is, what do you have for me? And I need to hear that clearly. So as I walk forward, because the people around us, if they are not hearing the voice of God, they will say, that's crazy. God's plan for us is way bigger than what we can do. It's going to take more than we have, more grace, more finances. It's going to take more. So at some point, people are going to be like, you're crazy. If the world looks at what we're doing, there's a guarantee it's not going to make sense. Because if we can do it, there's a good chance it's us. So what is the influence that we're allowing to pour into us that at the end of the day allows us to pour back into others? You know, this, this new year, happy new year, by the way. Hey, we made it, right? 2020, the big one. I don't know why it seems so big to me. It did. It was just always this thing way out there, and now it's going the other direction. You know, uh, I don't know how many people do New Year's resolutions. I love them. I usually don't make it all the way through the year, but I, I do like, I, I like a fresh start. 
How many, how many people did something this year, a New Year's resolution this year? Raise your hand. Something. Okay, quite a few of us. You know, I think most, um, most resolutions, I think, in our life um, have to do with a change of habit. Not all of them, but I think often when we look at uh, um, something, it could be other things, but I think it's often something we try to break a habit in our lives. I was kind of thinking this year, well, I've been in my life thinking, okay, God, if I could give anything up or if there was something in my life that you could just magic wand change, right? Like wake up one day. I had this happen. I smoked cigarettes for like 15 years. I woke up one day and didn't want to smoke a cigarette anymore. That was like 19 years ago. Come on, I woke up. Come on, that's awesome. I tried everything to quit smoking. But God did something. We moved to Yuba City. It's, we were in the will of God. When we moved here, I woke up and just, boom, it was broke off my life. Didn't want it. Well, there's been other things I've had to fight for, right? I'm always like, come on, God, you did it here. Just do it here and here and here and maybe here and do it for them, <laughs> right? There's times in my life where there's been grace and stuff's been just, there's been uh, the grace for it and it's been broke off. There's been a change. But more than often, it's been something I've had to dig deep and fight for. And I know for, for this year, I was like, oh, what is the one thing that I, I would like to change? And I was thinking, if you could do anything in me, I want to be disciplined. Just disciplined. And I thought, man, that would be awesome. Just to be disciplined. Just to wake up one morning and not be cigarettes, but just like, boom. And I know to me that seems kind of far, just far out there, far-fetched. It was like, man, to be disciplined in every area, finances, food, health, right? What I think, just across the board, it seems impossible. And I was reading through the scripture, and what's amazing is, what if I told you I found a secret in the Bible, no joke, that tells us how to be disciplined in every area of our life? No joke. Would you be interested? I found it. This is no joke. I'm not exaggerating. Are you ready for this? It's in James 3, 2. Seriously, here's what it says. Indeed, we all make many mistakes. Say mistakes. For if we could control our tongues, we would be perfect and could also control ourselves in every other way. That two-ounce muscle in our mouth, <laughs> the beast. You know, I was, I, I was reading that, and I just thought, what the heck? <laughs> if I could just control my tongue, I would be perfect and could also control myself in every area of my life. That's an intense statement, guys. And I started looking at you, what, what would that look like in my life? And what does that even mean? Because, guys, I want to be a man of discipline. I don't mean a little bit. I mean, I am striving to be a man of discipline. I want it. Because to me, a man of discipline is what changes me and what is allowing God to use more of me. I just believe that. So I looked up the definition of a tongue, and I, I'm going to butcher some of these words. It's very quick, though, so I'm not throwing it up there because then you guys would judge me. If I'm reading it, you have no idea. So if you're a doctor, just not allowed to do it tonight. It says, the tongue is a muscular organ in the mouth. The tongue is covered with pink tissue called mucosa. We'll just go with that. Tiny bumps called papilla give the tongue its rough texture. Thousands of taste buds covered the surface of the tongue. Taste buds are collections of nerve-like cells that connect to nerves running to the brain. Sounds pretty cool. The tongue is, an, is anchored to the mouth by a web of tough tissue. The tether holding down the front of the tongue is called the frenum. In the back of the mouth, the tongue is anchored into the hy hyoid bone. Yeah, you guys, some of you guys know that one. The tongue is vital for chewing and swallowing food, as well as for speech. 
You know, the tongue is seemingly the smallest muscle in our body. Well, yet at the same time, it is probably the most dangerous of what we have. I think f some people do better than others. Some people have a lot better handle on that the little beast than others. Some people don't do a very good job of it. <laughs> the sound of a closing casket is probably the last time that those, those words are murmured. Come on, at that point, it's under control. I would ask us all to think about putting that muscle above all else this year. You know, I think as far as, for me, I know we, most of us know what Icon is, and, and we've been working out. A lot of you guys have been part of that. It's awesome. And people are talking about um, their eating habits and how to change some stuff and restructure some stuff. And all that is awesome. And as I looked at this, I thought, man, how much more important is it that we start to control this muscle in our lives? James 3, 1 through 12. James talks about it. He says, dear brothers and sisters... This is probably, to me, the scariest verse in the whole Bible, but I usually just skip to, to verse 2, but it says, not many of you should become teachers in the church. <laughs> Check this out. For we who teach will be judged more strictly. <laughs> it's redacted. <laughs> he just ripped that page out. You know, that, that verse made me just want to do something else with my life, you guys. <clears throat> like, I'm, no, I'm not better than anybody else. And if you're sitting back there thinking, he's going to be judged more strictly? Who would want? Come on. <laughs> that, to me, is scary. Moving on. He throws that little, little piece in there. Indeed, we all make many mistakes. For if we could control our tongues, we would be perfect and could also control ourselves in every other way. We can make a large horse go wherever we want by the means of a small bit in its mouth. James is starting to talk about some, some, some visuals for us to try to figure out the reality of how important and how powerful our tongue is. It's amazing to me that a powerful horse, a stallion, these muscular animals that are just so phenomenal that we can put a small bit in its mouth and once we're up on top of it, can control it and have it go usually where we want it to go. Not always. Uh, yeah, often not. But at the same time, we have a way better chance than if there was no bit in its mouth, right? And I, I, let's move on. It says, and the small rudders makes a huge ship turn wherever the pilot chooses to go, even though the winds are strong. You know, I don't know if you've ever been on a cruise. Um, we went to Ensenada here quite a few years ago, and um, <clears throat> the up and down of the boat didn't settle with my wife. I don't know if you've ever been with somebody who was on one of those trips that wasn't as exciting. I was loving it. It's like, this is awesome. Not, not so much for her. But what blew me away, it always does. When I see these vessels come down, they're just giant to these cities with lights, and just massive amounts of people, it's unbelievable to me that there's just a captain up there in that little window able to turn that massive thing wherever it wants to go just with a small rudder. James jumps it up one further. says, in the same way the tongue is a small thing that makes grand speeches, but a tiny spark can set a great forest on fire. And among all, the body part of the tongue is a flame of fire. You know, paradise fire, there's a lot of things that we know. Fire is so devastating. And James is trying to correlate the reality of a small spark destroying forest and people, all the stuff that it does by something so small. Several times in my life, unfortunately, I have almost caught things on fire. I almost caught the freeway on Highway 20 on fire when it was really high in weeds. It was bad. 
and God help me. I, I filled, I had a burn pile, and it was the wrong time of year to be doing it. And I, like, I took a, um, a plastic cup and filled it with gas. Well, I dumped it out, and, and on the way over, I didn't notice that it had burned a hole in the bottom. So I had, a, I had a, literally a gas trail to my burn pile. So I burn piled it and saw the gas trail go that way. And I started shoveling, but I was shoveling inside the, was like still dry grass. So as I shoveled, it wasn't going out. It was just making it worse. Full-blown panic. Full-blown panic. I had a shovel, which my dad taught me. I did not bring the water out or fire extinguisher. So by the time I got that, got the, by the time I got the hose out there, was hosing everything off, God totally helped me, and I got the fire out. Thank you, Jesus. Literally, I almost burned down Highway 20. I was looking at Highway 20, just miles of that dry grass, and I thought, oh, my goodness. But fire in my life has been almost devastating. You know, we were camping, and uh, um, we have these one-gallon gas cans of the white gas for, like, Coleman stoves and stuff. So I thought, how do you start a fire? Way better with more gas. And when I splashed it... It got into the actual can, and I dropped the can, and it was gurgling out. And as it was gurgling out on the ground, fire was just a whoop. And I knew it was going to explode. Fortunately, we were in sand. So I was able to get it out. It was one of the worst things because everybody that was there was in these 10,000-foot, square-foot RVs set up just watching us. So this lady brings over burn cream because I'd burn my hand. <laughs> Embarrassing. We, we went out for dinner. <laughs> Straight up. We left. We left. Fire's not been good to me, but God has been good to me that I haven't burnt down massive, massive things. It's a whole world of wickedness corrupting your entire body. It can set your whole life on fire. For it is set on fire by hell itself. People can tame all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and fish, but no one can tame the tongue. It is restless and evil, full of deadly poison. Hmm. I think a lot of times we don't think we're doing too bad in the in the column of our tongue. I think as Christians and as people, I think we often, maybe, maybe you think that I'm not doing great at all, but I think others might feel like they're doing pretty well. So I just wanted to throw out a few things that happen through our tongue. Ephesians 4.25 says, stop, so this is lying. So stop telling lies. Let us tell our neighbors the truth. For we are all part of the same body. Boasting. Proverbs 27.2 says, Let someone else praise you, not your own mouth. A stranger, not your own lips. Complaining. Philippians 2.14-15 says, Do everything without complaining and arguing. Anybody messed up on that one Today? It says everything, guys, I underline. Do everything without complaining and arguing so that no one can criticize you. Live clean, innocent lives as children of God, shining like bright lights in the world full of crooked and perverse people. You know, complaining is something that obviously it's, I think it's not just in us, it's so acceptable in our culture that we're called to do it on like Yelp, we're called to complain everywhere. That's what we do. It's, it's what our world has said is not just acceptable, but it's what we're, what we're supposed to do. Yet it goes against what God is and what he says to do. Sarcasm. Ephesians 5.4. Obscene stories, foolish talk, coarse jokes. These are not for you. Instead, let there be thankfulness to God. 
I don't know about you, but I am a little sarcastic at times. I've always in the past said, if, if I tease you, it's because I love you. And so I know that we, we do a lot of sarcasm, we a lot of fun, but the thing is, there's obviously it's been several times in my life where I've crossed that line. There's been so many times in my life where we've used sarcasm in our house with friends, relationship, and we know it. It ends up bringing out other stuff that brings pain and uncertainty. Exaggeration. Colossians 3.9. Don't lie to each other, for you have stripped off your old sinful nature and all its wicked deeds. Not following through, James 5.12. My Christian brothers, do not swear. Do not use heaven or earth or anything else to swear by. If you mean yes, say yes. If you mean no, say no. You will be guilty for saying anything more. You know we're called to not make promises. We do it all the time. People do it, I promise you this. You know we're actually called to not swear and say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to promise you I'm going to do this. What kind of place would we live in if people's yes were their yes and no were their no, guys? God's, God's saying this two-ounce muscle that we have, can we say yes and just have it be our yes? I think when we look at, we look at the Scripture and think, man, taming the tongue, I, I think I do pretty good at that. How good are we doing at just where we're at so far? I put two on the next one, critical and discouraging don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be encouraging to those who hear them. We were um, in Southern California here this last week for, um, for Christmas break. We went down there and spent a few days with my sister. It was awesome. And I've never been to this place. It's called Sprouts. It's like a grocery store. And it's health food. Is why I've not been in it in my past. <laughs> So we go into Sprouts now, and uh, just the name I would have drove by, <laughs> right? Sprouts. Don't need those. <laughs> Rolling on. So we stopped at Sprouts to get some, to get some food uh, at the grocery store, and we're about wrapping up, and I see this family, and uh, there's a family of five, and their oldest son, who's probably 12, is parenting their daughter, and he's doing an awesome job. This kid's knocking out of the park. Parents, not so much. And I saw the dad start to undermine his kid because his kid was taking his role. Right? Like his kid was actually doing a great job parenting this, this child is because dad wasn't. And so the kid tried to not argue but was just like dad. They were right there having this conversation. And I saw him just, just pounding his son. And the little girl sticks her tongue out at the boy and walks off. Win. That's exactly what she took that little, that little two-ounce thing and, and just I could see him, just the light fading on him. And I think it's, it's often easy to see when we're not in it. Yet God is calling us to something so much deeper than that. So I'll ask us again, how are we doing at taming our tongues. You know, we were just actually headed down to Southern California, the same trip, and uh, I saw a motorcycle cop coming up the emergency lane. We're on the freeway. I'm in the fast lane because that's pretty much where I stay. And this motorcycle <laughs> cop's coming up, and I see my mirror, so I get over. Well, the car behind me didn't see him, so he instantly filled the gap. So when the cop came by, he had plenty of room. The guy turned his blinker on. And he couldn't get over. I kind of merged a little bit. Cop goes right by. And this dude, full on rage. So he gives me the, one of the fingers and starts yelling. And so I rolled my window down to say, hey, I saw the cop. Sorry, there's plenty of room. That didn't work out so well. It ended by him saying he was going to smash my face in if we pulled over. And the amazing thing is, <clears throat> I was like, I, didn't, I just tried to explain myself to him and rolled the window up. And we kept driving. And I told my wife, that's amazing. The old me would have given him a chance to smash my face in on the side of the road. 
I would have given him an opportunity, which is insane. But more than that, I realized there was not, there wasn't that stuff in me that caused me to be angry back and start having to defend myself or whatever that is. That thing in me had changed, and I told my wife, that's honestly, babe, it's amazing. I didn't even feel like at all, I'll use the word icky for a lack of a better word. I just thought, man, that dude's a, bum- that's a bummer. His family had to listen to that. He was just obviously had a lot more going on in his life. But so often, his response could have influenced me that would have been a, could have been a terrible vacation. And I think that we need to ask ourselves that same thing. Hmm. It's happened to my, me over and over again where people have said stuff that has influenced me. And there's times where I have bit on it. I mean, full on. I was, I was probably 17 years old. We were in Southern California. We pulled over to a 7-Eleven. I'll never forget this. We're feeling up, and it's me and my two friends are twins. Twin, twin boys, we were heading up to my sister's house, which was up, up the mountain. It was snowing. And this homeless guy, um, he, he comes kind of out of the bushes, and he's drunk, and he comes up to me, and, and he just tells me, he says, you guys, you, you guys are, are going to get in a wreck. And he points at me and says, you're going to die tonight. I'm just, we're at 7-Eleven, and I'm pumping, pumping the gas in my car. Well, I wasn't at a good place in my life, so I, I became violent towards him, and I was just yelling at him and telling him he was homeless and that tomorrow I'd be home in a warm house with Christmas, with family. You know, I just was just belittling him. And uh, we got in the car. It was about an hour and a half, hour and 20-minute drive. It was the safest we've ever driven in our entire lives of that icy road. <laughs> and we got there. We were safe. Obviously, I didn't die. But... There's so many times, that may seem extreme, maybe we have people come into our lives and what they say or what they do has a massive opportunity to influence us. Massive. Happens all the time. Or we have the opportunity to influence them. I know for a fact if a homeless guy stumbled out of the bushes, told me I was going to die tonight, it would be an awesome time of us talking to him and loving on him and praying with him. It would be a totally different setting. How are we doing at other people and their influence? Are we, is that just grabbing on to stuff in us? Gossip. Proverbs eleven thirteen. A gossip goes around telling secrets. But those who are trustworthy can keep confidence. Man, gossip's a big one. Slander, Psalms 101.5. I will not tolerate people who slander their neighbors. I will not endure conceit and pride. That two-ounce muscle in our mouth has potential to draw us into so many different directions. Um, I don't have these up there, so you can just leave that up there. I don't, I'm just going to read through a couple of these. There's so many scriptures for this, but Proverbs 17, 28, even fools are thought wise when they keep silent. <laughs> I love that. With their mouths shut, they seem intelligent. Such a good Proverbs. <laughs> Proverbs 16, 28. A troublemaker plants seeds of strife. Gossip separates the best of friends. Proverbs 18, 19. An offended friend is harder to win back than a fortified city. Arguments separate friends like a gate locked with bars. Proverbs 14, 21 says... It is a sin to belittle one's neighbor. Blessed are those who help the poor. I just wrote in my notes, I put, it is not uncommon for a man to speak of great things God has done, then curse out someone on the job site. It's not uncommon for a lady to speak so well about the Lord, even quote scripture, 
but then defile someone behind their back with gossip. It's not uncommon for a preacher to speak so elegant in front of a congregation, but then that same tongue be too frustrated, it snaps with his impatience with his family at home. Our tongues, no matter where we are, are dangerous. Proverbs 25, 11 through 12. We know that the tongue has the ability to be so negative and so spiteful and so ugly, and yet it has the same ability to do the opposite. Proverbs 25, 11 through 12 says, Timely advice is lovely, like golden apples in a silver basket. To one who listens, valid criticism is like a gold earring or other gold jewelry. Proverbs 25, I'm sorry, 12, 25. Worry weighs a person down. An encouraging word cheers a person up. Guys, I know in my own life how much the tongue has allowed itself to get away. I also realize that me on a journey of discipline, when I see that, that if I can discipline this, I can discipline every area that I'm, I'm, I'm headed for. It's what I want. I want to be disciplined in my life. The amazing thing is that our tongue can do the opposite. We've seen it. We can encourage and uplift and speak positive and we can have joy. We can be the opposite of what so often our tongue does. Proverbs 18, 21. The tongue can bring death or life. Those who love to talk will reap the consequences. I believe one day God will ask us what we did with the influence that we had. I think most of us, I said it earlier, have way more influence than we realize. We have way more influence than we realize. Whether it's our husbands, wives, family, neighbors, we have way more influence than we realize. And some of us have less than we think we do. I don't know about you guys, but I, I've always wanted my influence to be a positive thing. I think most of us as Christians think that's what I want in my life. I want to be a man or a woman of God who has a, a positive influence and can push the kingdom of God forward. And I think so often he's looking at that in our lives through being the opposite of the things that we just talked about. The opposite of not, not being criticizing and, and saying harsh words or being all of the things that so often come to the forefront of our mouths. Guys, how well are we doing in our personal walk with taming our tongue? Because I believe God is calling us to a much deeper relationship in a place of watching that two ounce mass. Because we could, spend, we could spend a whole lot of time discussing how, how powerful, we know how powerful our words are, but there's so much in Scripture that talks about life coming from our mouth, death coming from our mouth. And I'm not even talking about life and death coming because you're standing in front of somebody, but life or death coming when you're in your own room and saying it. We know it. There's huge power. We know that God created the universe with words. We, we've, we've, seen, we've seen time and time again where it talks about the words we have, the words that are spoke over others, the words that were spoke over ourselves. You know, the Bible talks about us having a filter, that everything goes through a filter in our, in our thoughts and our minds when we hear things, but it says that our own words pass through that filter because we trust ourselves. So when we speak positive things, even our own life, and, and encouraging things over our own, we know how much power it has, guys. We know it does. And I think so often we say the negative thing and not the positive thing. There was years ago in my relationship with my wife and others, I thought, I'm going to start saying the things I'm thinking, not the negative things. I'm already doing that. 
But I'm going to start saying the positive things that often I might say, to, I might think, man, my wife looks nice today, but I'd not say it. It's so simple. I know we know this. But guys, I think what we don't realize is how much power it has to keep us in a place of pushing us forward in kingdom business. Keeping our households healthy and our marriages healthy and our relationships around us. And then having our influence push out so far that we're able to be the opposite where we're actually encouragers and creating an atmosphere of joy and positive, those things. It's what we're called to do. I know it is. And I'll say it again because I know it's so true. I know that most of us in this room don't realize the influence we have. Maybe because we think we don't have enough friends or we don't have enough this or we're not that place at work or whatever it is. I think most often we don't realize the massive influence that we have that God wants to use to bring people to the kingdom, to bring people to Christ, to see people healed, to see ourselves set free at a deeper level, to hear the Holy Spirit more. He wants to use those. The question is, are we willing to begin to tame the beast? I don't know about you guys, I am thankful for New Year's. I love a new year. I love the, the thought of me having a clean slate. For the most part of my life, I've been thankful for a new morning, to be honest with you. Like, honestly, I've woke up and thought, man, I, I've got, I haven't sinned. I've got a new day, fresh start. It doesn't matter what yesterday was. I have a whole other opportunity to... I don't know about you guys, but I don't want my words, my tongue to cause others to stumble, to cause others to miss the will of God in their lives, to cause others to have pain and hurt. We know that it's our tongue on this campus, on this house, on this body, on your work, on your family. It's, it's what we do with that that creates the atmosphere that we're in. All it takes is one person, and we know that. It just takes one person because there's so much power in the tongue that it, it breathes death. One person in a house can cause it. And if that's, if that's us, if that's you, stop it. Guys, God is calling us to something so much deeper. I also know that the power of death and the power of life, like I said, we get it at levels. I think most of us get it, but I don't think we do. I think there's so much more in it that when we speak things, we're not realizing how much power those things have in our relationships and in our household and over, speaking them over us. I almost said it again tonight. I often say I'm an idiot. Just messing around. I'm just like, I'm an idiot. That's what I say. And usually people laugh because they're like, he's an idiot. <laughs> or I say I'm stupid. Like when we're playing around and do something, I always say it. But um, I was with a friend just the other day, and he's like, dude, you need to quit saying that, man. You're speaking death over yourself. You're not an idiot. And I, I was like, whatever. And I, it goes back to that place of us, that fine line, guys. Wherever we're at in our walk right now, we should be striving for more. And I know that there's been times where uh, there was this family that every time you said, I said, I'm not feeling good or something, they'd say, don't say that. Don't speak that over yourself. It was always. And I always took it to the extreme where I thought like my arm would be cut off. There'd be blood squirting out. They'd be like, quit saying your arm's off. <laughs> I'm fine, right? Like, like it, early on in my walk, I heard these people just like, don't say that because to me, I didn't understand the power of my words. I didn't get it. I didn't understand that, that as I spoke things, I was speaking things into the, into the spirit and then speaking them into the natural. I didn't get it. I didn't get it. And I think most of us don't get it. So how about we work together this year whether you want to call it a New Year's resolution or just knowing what is the right thing, how about we work together to begin to really pay attention to this two-ounce beast of a muscle we have that, that, that we can use for the kingdom. Guys, we have an opportunity to have God use us 
constantly? Or we have an opportunity for the enemy to use us constantly. So I don't know about you, but I want to pray for us. So why don't we stand up? Because I want to pray that God will be loud in our hearts and loud in our ears to begin to help us to be disciplined in every area of our lives that starts with our tongue. God, we, we repent. God, we are sorry for the things that we've allowed to escape our mouth. God, we, we are sorry for the things we've said to our families, our friends, our, our coworkers, to, to you. We are sorry. But God, we want to be men and women who are disciplined, who are at the forefront of what you have for us. We want to be used by you to push your kingdom forward. We want it. So God, I ask Holy Spirit that you will remind us when we, we, there's a few categories I mentioned. There's so many things we can do. I ask Holy Spirit, you remind us in the moment, right then, that is not okay. Holy Spirit, that you will, will begin to put a bridle in our mouths to be able to quiet ourselves. Don't allow us to be used by the enemy, but allow us to be used by your Spirit. So, God, I ask that all of the words that we speak, that as they come out, we will, again, realize that you've given us great influence because of your spirit, but you also have, have, have asked us to monitor it. So, Holy Spirit, we just, I just ask, we just lay down all the stuff we've said at the foot of the cross, and we ask, Holy Spirit, help us to be the encouragers and the lifter-uppers and the ones at the forefront, it just pushing people forward and making people excited about you and being testimonies about your goodness and your favor. Don't allow us to be the opposite. We desperately need your help. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. amen.